purpose of the NDLC is to really talk about the relationships of women and growing women's leadership. One of the changes we made on Sunday was no longer we call it the C-suite, we're going to call it women's leadership because we change titles so much. The management comes in, changes in the industry. What does C-suite mean? Well, C-suite is supposed to mean CEO, CFO, COO, when you're not a CMO, go to the list. So let's just change it to women's leadership because you can have so many different layers and so many different things. And some of the issues is getting C-suite technically top five, 10 on a council is tough because we all run two, three, four, five jobs, have personal lives, bandwidth. And then on top of it, get all women? He even adds to it when we talk about the statistics being so small, right? So the idea is, is that these are women who have, not because of where they work, or where they have worked, or where they currently work, have the passion and heart to step outside and say, I want to advance in Naomi. Yes, thank you. That want to step outside that comfort zone and become uncomfortable to help advance women at all employment levels and to develop a system to improve that. So we have three subcommittees. We have the women's leadership, we have mentoring and education, and then we have media and communication because what happens outside these well, inside these four walls needs to happen outside these four walls more than it needs to happen inside these four walls, correct? So the idea is that these women have agreed to participate. We meet every month um, on the phone, talk about challenges, what we're doing, how we can advance, take it back to our companies, our personal and professional growth. And a lot of times we talk about personal issues, not just about how we can help women, but how we can help support each other in a situation or how we can just share our stories amongst us. And so one of the things, as I said earlier, is that I have this incredible knack of getting people to say things that they normally wouldn't say because I expose myself first and I dress myself, not physically in the nature, but mentally. So I allow them to expose and experience my experiences and also for themselves. Because as we heard the last three days is what? It's trust and it's the human element of understanding and experiencing and, and how you feel at the end of the day. I'm not perfect. I make more mistakes than my kids will tell you I'm perfect, you know, 404 educational level on how to make you feel great and bad at the same time and have this turn on, turn off. Um, and I say that's because my brain is running 500 miles an hour and I, I forget to stop and say hi. Um, and so I'll start off the panel. There's no prescriptive. It is completely organic, so I can start with my deficiencies in, in exposure and things like that. A lot of you might know that I was the only girl I played on the uh, entire water polo league back in 1971. It is now an Olympic sport for women. But part of that toughness, toughness was is that your body is a piece of meat underneath water physically, mentally, and emotionally. So every guy that's ever been in the water with me, too much information, I get it. But I had to I had the resilience to go back to them and said, don't think of what they're doing to your body, think about how you can outsmart them. And one thing that I like to say that one of the gentlemen did to me, is he thought he'd be so swift that I was gonna be in this air head that you know how in water polo you have to start at each of the sides, right? That you that you the whistle and you take off, go right. That as soon as he the whistle was blown and he's swimming and says he's swimming meeting him in the middle, he decides that he is going to swim on the bottom of a 12-foot deep pool, the entire length across the bottom, and then go on the opposite side to the goal, out the part where I can see him and then get to catch the ball and throw for goal. And I'm swimming head up, you know, doing what you're doing, and I'm thinking, you know, where is my guy? And I see him floating directly on top of the black line, and can barely see him. Because I'm a perfectionist, I notice 
Every little thing as it's moving. I saw him and I was laughing so hard I was almost drowning because here he was swimming and it's gonna come up. And so I let him do his thing and I'm just doing the breaststroke and I'm just slightly going. And I see him on the side and he comes up and says, hi. And they go throw a pre-planned ball. I intercept it, throw it to my guy and he's four. <laughs> so the idea is, is that leveraging that, oh, you're inferior. You're not strong enough. You're a woman. How dare you? I was 15 pounds heavier then than I am now. I have a lot of bulk, a lot of muscle. Um, so the idea is that that was my story. That helped me get to the strength that, oh, you clean up. Oh, you look good today. Well, what did I look like yesterday? Like crap? Um, how dare you say that? Yes, I'm a tomboy. Through and through, I heard several people say that. Oh. Sarah just told me that she's a tomboy. You clean up very well. But how dare you say that when I can look me, look at me, it's my health. Look at how good I feel, look how good I resonate. Don't appear, don't judge me based on what I'm wearing, whether I'm wearing a four thousand dollar, you know, Giorgio Armani today, or whether I'm wearing a twenty dollar hand-me-down that my my older brother gave me. I was not allowed to wear clothes that were mine until I was eight, other than what my mom made me. My first pair of jeans was when I was 13, that I bought myself because I made my own money. So those are my stories that built me to my strength. So I want each one of these women to talk about something, and each one's going to leverage on it, something that you've never heard about them, and they feel compelled to tell you today. Vanessa, you're first on the block. Oh, lucky me. <laughs> and you have your boss sitting in here, so he wants to know every dirty thing about you. So, for a lot of people, the story resonated with me because when I was starting out my career as an originator, I thrived. It was a dream come true, helping families, individuals purchase their home, and every family in person is like a puzzle. Like, oh my God, I'm going to help you get a house? And this is how much you qualify, and I cry, and I do really well at my job. And then, lo and behold, I started reporting to people that I'm like, hmm, if she or he can do it, I can do it. So I was working at um, a company I really liked, at Countrywide, and I was one of their top producers, and the position came up to be a manager in California in Van Nuys. Van Nuys is like 99 or 96% Hispanic. And I wanted to be a manager there, be a branch manager, because I knew underwriting, I knew loans. Uh, so I felt really compelled, like, I can do this, I got this. And uh, I was 27 years old. I had great numbers behind me, great track record. My manager wrote letters of recommendation, everything, and I was ready to go. I felt I could do this. So in the interview, he was new to the company. He was not from Countrywide. And uh, my competitor was there, one of my girlfriends, and she was uh, an assistant manager. I'm like, oh my God, Julie is here. She's definitely going to get it. She's more qualification. But together we were like two thriving young Latinas. And to this day, Julie is still one of my girls, one of my friends, divas. And we applied. And there was this other gentleman, so it was only three of us interviewing. And I remember being in the room with this gentleman, or this man, should I say. And he let me know right away. He gave me, he didn't even give me the time of day for the interview. And he said, you know, the best qualified person for this role is a male and white. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm 27, thriving, doing really well. I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, you know, the demographics of this area is Latinos, right? There's predominantly Hispanics living here. And really, Hispanics like doing business with Hispanics normally. And the primary decision maker is the mom, the wife, or the grandma. You know, the female matriarch is very powerful beyond the male to make the decisions of home buying. And here I am, 27, and I felt like a bird with my wings clipped. I'm like, how dare he speak to me this way? Because in my household, my biggest cheerleader were my parents and my grandmother. And I was like, no, no, no. He looked to say, uh, needless to say, that gave me that drive to not accept no for an answer. I felt very discouraged. 
That was the tr first time in my career that I really experienced sexism and racism, because I've experienced it at a younger age, but not in my career, not when you're talking to a top producer. I'm like, what? So instead of staying, I left, and I went to another competitor who I got the position of a branch manager, what I wanted, because somebody else did believe in me and gave me that opportunity. But when one door closes, another one will open. When somebody says no, you say yes, and you make it happen for you. So that was one of my stories that I will never forget, and to this day, always follow your gut where you want to be, and if somebody says no, you know what, it's okay. They'll say no, but somebody else will say yes. That's my question. I know you're the instruments of Fanny Mae, but uh, you have to pick well, it up. No, I was thinking, damn, it sucks to follow Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing to top that. Uh, what did you say? Imagine us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then I'll like, have because I'll make it really bad and then I'll cut some lots of um, So, Desiree, you, I did make the comment that I would tell what, and I am, and I embrace that word. There's a lot of controversy about that word if we start talking about gender identity. But I understand that some people like it. I like it. I grew up a tomboy, watched a lot of sports, played a lot of sports, rode crew in high school, I played rugby in college. As it turns out, our chief operating officer and our chief financial officer at Fanny Mae also played rugby, both women as well. So we have three top women all who played rugby. I don't know what, what that is about the workers. Um, and I as I said on the, the panel I was on, I really am an age, I've always been an outgoing person and had a job outside the law, went to law school at night, became a law firm lawyer, and it totally suited me, right, in, in many, many ways. But I didn't want to be in-house because I thought that's, I really want to be part of a community with a mission that a whole company shares, that's, that's doing something that I want to, you know, and not just serving outside clients. We don't really know where the people are like, it goes into a black hole. I don't really know where it goes. I want to be part of it community of people, and um, was recruited into Bank of America, and you know, I had worked for these people for five years or so, it's like, I'll just be myself, the same person who they recruited in is the person they're gonna get, it's gonna be great. Turns out, people expect something different from you as an internal partner than as an outside partner. Outside lawyer, you can be your total A, go get them, tell them what to do all day long person, but in-house, you're a partner. You better listen more, and here's this dirty secret about law school. Even though it's probably one of the most important traits as a lawyer, a lot of lawyers don't listen well. And it was clear to me that Alex is a good listener from what he, you know, we, what he talked about on the stage, but a lot of lawyers are not good listeners. We are not trained to be listeners in law school. And I learned a lot about myself and how to be more effective, and frankly, how to be a better person and friend outside of work, too really improved me as a person that experience from going outside of what was clearly a company. It's something that I love a lot even more in-house, but I did have to figure out how to be more effective, <coughs> how to listen better, and also the comical and collective. That's not a, that, that was, you wouldn't have thought that about me if you had met me when I was 20 or 34. It was a, she's a go-getter, and she's smart, and she gets her stuff done. But you wouldn't have thought that it was much more sort of laser intense all the time. But I found as a lawyer that intensity can overwhelm people, and so I sort of I brought it down a notch. So I found you know maybe it suits me as I age to to do that. But I thought um, that's my story to share. Yeah, more to go, Stacy. Sure. Okay. So yes, I've gone barefoot. We all have. So for me, I'm a natural introvert. And so I too played sports. That was like my safe haven growing up. Um, I loved it, because anytime anybody challenged you or pissed you off, you didn't really have to say anything. You just get out on the court and you show them, right? That's right. So that's what I did. And so um, taking that into the workforce, now I've been at Freddie for 26 years. A lot has happened in 26 years. And um, sometimes people mistake my quietness for weakness. And that is not the case. And so I may not say anything right then, but you better believe that 
I'm trying to figure out my strategy because I'm going to take you to the moon. And we're going to get down. It's yeah. a beautiful yeah. right now. And so, you know, I, I just have a different way. I'm not very vocal. I'm not going to argue. You know, I get my point across. I don't talk to hear myself talk. But when I do talk, you know, I have something to say. And so at Freddie, which is very male heavy, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to get your voice out there. So I'm not going to fight for that. I'm not going to fight for that position. Um, I've been there, like I said, a long time. So I know a lot more than a lot of people that are there that, that just got there. And so, you know, when I tell you, well, no, I don't think we can do it that way. You might want to check with legal on that. Or we did that 10 years ago, and this is what happened, but they want to do it anyway. Okay. All right. And so I just keep tabs on that. And then when it's time to take over the court, I got it. Yeah. So I'm just a, a quiet thunder. I love it. I love it. Yes. Good job. So I'm so new to all of you. <coughs> Maybe something I can tell you a little bit about Indian culture and what why. So, uh, I don't know, you saw my articles. I was born in a middle class where my parents, uh, my mom and dad, crossed the caste lines uh, uh, of the South Indian society and married. You know, it's, it's worse than here, right? You know, here, cross racial marriages are, uh, 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 you know, are, uh, yeah, more and more, yeah, accepted. I'm telling you the story of 1916 when my parents got married. My mother was born in the highest caste line, and then my father and mother. So they already were, had broken the societal norms and made a life for each other. So here I am, I was born to them, and uh, I, I often like to joke that uh, the qu questioning the status quo was bred into my genes, having been born in that family. Now, I was always looked upon differently in schools. You know, here is I'm a smart uh, young girl, I, I was at the time, and by store, not not in one year or the other. Believe it or not, my teachers used to call me hybrid, and I didn't. I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> I didn't because I didn't understand the undertones of those messages. Really, when you're a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, you know, you don't. But because you live in a neighborhood which is very homogenous to one way, you know, you don't. Uh, you, you know, somewhat, somewhat, you're different. Parents look slightly differently, or you know, your mom goes to work when others didn't, and so on. So I thought it was part of it. But it came to four, so I'm, I was the only girl with brothers, right? So my parents would not even let me. I, I lived in such a protective bubble. You know, some of you can relate to. My father would not even let me go alone outside of the home. My brothers had to escort me anywhere. This is a ridiculous life when I think about how protective I was, and I didn't have any clue about how the world worked. You know, I was in my books, and so anyway, long story short, I come to this 10th grade, so I was 15, not yet 16, um, and uh, uh, I went to Catholic school, only women, girls school, and uh, we, the mother superior got wind of the fact that I was going to be named, uh, you know, having attained the first rank in, uh, in the state equivalent of your state here, state of Tamil Nadu. So think about this is hundred thousand students, more than hundred thousand students taking this 10th standard exam coming first. So everybody is thrilled, they ordered sweets and balloons to celebrate it. And then this uh, reporter comes who comes to my house and then interviews me. So we are all geared up for this news breaking tomorrow. So tomorrow the news was going to come and tonight this e this today the evening we got wind of the fact, uh, the reporter who interviewed uh, me tipped out the fact it's actually going to be a boy from another part of the city and my marks remained the same. He was awarded two extra marks and he became number one, the first track. But this happens in India. India was very corrupt. I mean, you can't, uh, I think, I don't know whether you can relate. In America, probably, this would not, this is a, such a meritocratic society. And lawsuits, fear of lawsuits, number one. But in India, you know, so because of whatever reason, that boy came from a 
higher caste and uh, parents were doctors, you know, whatever the lot of uh, reasons. And uh, I still remember, you know, to now I can conjure up all the pictures. My house was like, uh, as though there was a funeral being held. Because here I am 15 years old, all I know is I did not get my first flag, right? And everybody in the neighborhood came in and started counseling my parents, maybe you should sue, you know, I did unheard of this. I'm telling you the story a long time ago. And uh, my parents are completely heartbroken. Uh, just at the school, I know, was disappointed, you know. What are they going to do with all the sweets and chocolates and the balloons? <laughs> so, but that moment, I remember standing in, and I, I, everybody's advising, that I will never put myself in a position or in a, I will never go after anything that is not meritless whether it is college or any position and then when I reach there then it will be absolutely in control, right? Unambiguously, I am the first, I am the top. There is absolutely, there won't be any doubt. There is no, you know, she knew somebody or nothing of that sort is going to happen. It was a huge lesson for a 15 year old. You know, think about how vulnerable we all were when we are that time. So, actually then I went on to, I did not want to study in any of the, you know, uh, Indian universities that could do any of this. Um, you might have heard of IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. It's uh, one of the premier technology institutions in the world. It's, and getting into it is only by exam. No, no messing around with who knows who, you know, where you come from, who your parents are. You take an exam, half a million students take, less than one person gets into it. And uh, anyway, that uh, really gave me the resolve to go after I got in and, uh, you know, after that, but I think it was a staggering lesson to go through uh, for that at, at age, but it was a very valuable lesson. Um, so that's why when I see about affirmative action and so on, actually I could relate to what people on either side might be feeling, why the topic is so, you know, uh, sensitive, uh, in, uh, yeah, very uh, emotional for me. Thanks. Thank you for listening to my story. No, it's fantastic. It's horrible, but it's fantastic, right? Go ahead. And look at where you are now, right? Yeah. I mean, come on, unbelievable. Uh, and I have so many that it's like, uh, you know, I must be the only one that has experienced so, so many different uh, 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 things in my life. But I actually have one that I want to share with you because I think it's so, um, you know, so, you know, prominent. We see it a lot. So when I first started uh, my career in real estate, the uh, area that I focused on was relocation. I don't know if any of you do relocation. I was in business development, and the role that I did was I was very involved with uh, HR directors who actually, and you should if you don't, right? Because I knew a lot of people. So I decided to get involved with the uh, organization called SHRM, uh, Site Community Resource Management in Atlanta. And I actually am one of those people that we're born leaders. You have people that actually do a lot of volunteering, they're team moms. You know, no matter what, you gravitate to wanting to be the leader. And so I always uh, held different positions within Sherm Atlanta. I was head of communications, head of this, head of that. Maybe I did every role, y'all. It was five years of commitment of working with Sherm. To, and I don't have a problem talking about Sherm because they're a great organization. But I worked my butt off. And every group that I managed always got prizes, always was selected as the best you know, in class, you know, we were awarded on the national level, you know, awards for, for whatever we did. So I really wanted to be president. That was my goal of being president of Sherm Atlanta. And I um, never forget, I, you know, I worked so hard, hours and countless of times after work without seeing my children. And you, we all know this, right? My kids were small. But I would do all these events and not have time with my kids and sacrificed me because I really wanted to be president. And I met with the, the, the executive team at SHRM and expressed to them how important that was for me. And I'll never forget, it was all men. And, and, that, and, and again, no pun, no reason, it just happened to be that way. And I'll never forget, they said, you'll never be president of this organization. You just aren't good enough and you don't have leadership qualities. And I was like, devastated. I was like, what? I'm like, why did not tell me that before I started? I mean, it was just so devastating to me. 
uh, that here I worked so hard and wasn't able to get to the level of achievement of where I thought I should be because I, I was a woman and I was Latina and it really resonated with me, it really was. Um, and that's what I felt it was, that I was discriminated for those reasons. And so I went home and I cried like a baby and boo-hooed for days and I couldn't believe it. And my husband said, well, okay, well, you're Latina. Why don't you go after Latina organizations? Right? There's, there's those organizations out there. You're amazing, you're wonderful, you're fabulous. Don't let anyone tell you. This is my husband. And I'm telling you, if you don't, that man, you know? And so I said, okay, you're right. So I joined the, um, at the time, the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Within a year and a half, I was their incoming chair of the organization. Had way more members than the uh, Sheriff Atlanta chapter. And when, within two years, I started the uh, NAR Atlanta chapter and became president of that organization. And then in 2015, became national president of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Which, what? Right? So, I'm telling you, never, ever let anyone tell you that you are not good enough, that you can't do it, and that you are not what you want to be. Don't let anybody take that thunder away. What is the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you, non-professional? <laughs> and if I've heard it before, I will stop you midstream. <laughs> and we're going to start, because you're all thinking, I bet Churchill has some. She has a such, you know, well, I'll start with Churchill. <coughs> Joking aside, We've had this for a couple weeks now. Human versus computer, right? Women can take the world of So not as this embarrassing moment, but the idea is, is that she knows pop culture like no one's other. So what would you think that you thought you were doing, that you weren't doing, that you could say, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known? Cheerleaders 
for the little week. And we're like, oh my God, everyone's just dressed up and, you know, like in Sunday church, you know, dresses. And we look like so, like so out of the, you know, uh, out, of, uh, out of the pocket of what everyone was wearing. It was so embarrassing. And of course, those are your formative years. And you're already embarrassed about your family to begin with. Now that we're living in Mississippi, the second, we're Latino, third. Oh my God, what have we done? So it was just probably the most humiliating moment of my life because everybody laughed about our family and how crazy we were dressed up in all these, you know, to the nines. So that's embarrassing for me. Is that why you have a cemetery every Halloween? Absolutely. At your Mrs. Cemetery? I do, absolutely. She has a picture of her looking like Prince, and Rebecca Steele yesterday said, Oh, Prince? Oh, it's you? <laughs> We're not kidding. So anyway, in closing, um, if you were to give our uh, illustrious guests and attendees today something that you could give of value, bring it back to the seriousness, that would really help our delivery of relationships and keep it fun. Don't keep it serious. I don't want to hear I did this at work and da, 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 da. I want to keep it real on the human element only that you could say if you could quantify it into five words or less to keep this quick five words or less of wisdom of advancing women what would it be? And I'm going to start with I'm using seven words. Okay. <laughs> Break the rules already. What are yeah, yeah. Every interaction is either positive or negative. Excellent. Chincha. Big AI, AI, your companion, so the obvious is yes. <laughs> Excellent. Teresa. Never judge a book by a cover. Never. Right. Stacy. Uh, trust yourself and trust God. There you go. Vanessa. Be authentic. Excellent. And mine? I think, um, be organic and true to yourself. Listen. Thank you. Thank you all.